Okay, <clears throat> let's get let's get back. <clears throat> so, uh, just a few points uh, to to cover, uh, and uh, we'll proceed with uh, the next lecture. Uh, okay, so uh, where did we start? <clears throat> uh, so, first of all, I told you that uh, uh, we have some sort of uh, troubles when uh, we are trying trying to compare two models. Uh, whether uh, which one is uh, let's say uh, let's say better. Uh, why? Because it's uh, really complicated to aggregate all the data that you get from uh, validation of your model uh, into one number so that you can sort your models. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, that may be an issue you should be uh, aware of. Uh, well, the second thing I told you that uh, you should always keep in mind uh, your business metrics. Uh, so what is the problem, uh, the exact problem that you are solving? Uh, which cases are good? Which cases are bad? So uh, you should uh, think about it and uh, uh, find some, I don't know, some good definition what uh, you are considering as good or uh, bad uh, so that uh, you can go with it and uh, somehow construct uh, your <clears throat> uh, metrics uh, for, uh, for your model uh, to evaluate it. Uh, I just want to uh, show you, uh, this is a case of uh, multi-class uh, uh, classification that's uh, a very well-known uh, data set, uh, MNIST. Uh, it's uh, sort of uh, handwritten numbers, and uh, these numbers, uh, you are expecting your model to recognize these numbers, so uh, you are basically having 10 classes from 0 to 9. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> how do you evaluate that? Uh, there are once again, uh, many methods to evaluate, and uh, it's uh, really depend on the situation which one uh, you want to use. Uh, but uh, this is uh, one case uh, when you uh, when I asked uh, the library SK uh, learn to uh, print me some data on the quality of the model I was using, and it uh, gives me precision. I told you before. <clears throat> uh, recall. Uh, F1 score and uh, the number of uh, instances uh, that were in uh, the validation set. Uh, so uh, once more, uh, I uh, remind you that uh, in most cases you want to proceed with uh, so-called balanced data sets. Uh, so you want your training set and your validation set to contain more or less equal number of uh, instances of each class. Uh, why? Because when you are training your model uh, on a very unbalanced data set, of course, it will tend to work better with uh, the class you have the most in your uh, data set. Uh, of course, it's not a big tragedy if you are having, some, for example, I don't know, one more or 10 more examples of uh, some class, but uh, when uh, your data set uh, becomes really, really unbalanced, and in some cases, uh, you might even face with uh, data sets, uh, you are just, I don't know, downloading it from GitHub or whatever, wherever you are getting it, and you see that uh, there is tenfold more one class than another. It's not good. So uh, so your model will, in most cases, most models will uh, perform purely on that data sets just because they are unbalanced. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are uh, many methods to aggregate these uh, F1 scores. Uh, they, as you see, they are calculated for each class uh, to aggregate them into one number. Um, I, I will not uh, dive into details. Uh, you can find that uh, in documentation for SK Warren. Uh, one more nice visualization of uh, what we are doing, uh, so-called confusion matrix. So that's uh, true label uh, versus a predicted label. Basically, the same thing we saw for binary classifier. Uh, there was true and false, true labels, and true false predicted labels. Now you see just a bigger matrix because we have more classes. We have 10 classes that can be predicted, and of course, uh, 10 classes that can be true. Uh, what we are aiming for, uh, we want this matrix to be diagonal. So when it's diagonal, it's a perfect classifier. It works as, uh, as good as we can expect from it. And it gives us some additional information. So when we are looking at uh, the off-diagonal values, uh, we can see uh, whether it, uh, for example, mixes up two classes. So it may work good with, uh, let's say, eight classes. But uh, there will be two classes that it somehow mixes up and considers uh, them as one class or whatever. So something bad happens. 
And this can give you some insight into the problem. And you might think, okay, let's say this model cannot handle all the 10 classes, but maybe I can glue that classes into one entity. And if I get it, I can pass it to another model that will work with two classes only. That's a pretty good solution as well. So uh, you are not obliged to get uh, the, the, the result from one model. You can use few models chain, chained uh, and uh, <clears throat> a result from each model can be used as uh, some input of uh, the next model. So it's pretty okay to do that. <clears throat> uh, this thing I think I will cover in the next lecture that's about uh, assessing the regression uh, problem. Uh, there is a separate metric. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, one more thing uh, to know. Uh, we often get uh, some troubles with our models. Uh, and uh, there are two main classes uh, called underfit or overfit uh, and overfit. And uh, they are uh, <clears throat> also called uh, um, high variance and uh, high bias problems. Uh, well, what is that? Uh, this is uh, the image from, uh, as I called it, mathematician's uh, point of view. So you have a hypothesis set. So it's a set of uh, your uh, models. And uh, your uh, training procedure is uh, basically searching for a function in uh, this set uh, to be the best one, uh, uh, the closest one uh, to your target function f. And of course, uh, you can't uh, perfectly get this F in almost all cases. It's a really rare case when you can get this F into your hypothesis set. It happens, but it's really rare. So in most cases, it will lie somewhere outside. And uh, you will always get some, some error, some degree of discrepancy between these two functions. Uh, and this is called a bias. But there is another problem. Uh, when you are uh, creating your model, you are endowing it with that internal parameters that will be defined during training. The more parameters you define, the larger is your hypothesis set. But when you train your model, you have a data set. Uh, this data set is never perfect. It contains uh, <clears throat> uh, some sort of noises, some sort of outliers, so whatever. And if your uh, model uh, is uh, too flexible, uh, that data set uh, may spoil the, uh, the function you get as a result of training because it is too flexible. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's trying too hard uh, to go with all the data in your data set and, it's, uh, and it begins fitting some noises. I will show you an example uh, uh, right now. Uh, so uh, let's check <clears throat> some sort of uh, regression prob uh, problem. So this is our initial uh, data set. Uh, blue points are our training set. So that's some points I randomly chose uh, to, for our model to be trained on. Okay, red points, it's uh, points I randomly chose for our model to be validated on. So it's validation set. Uh, what do we expect? Uh, on the uh, right panel, you see uh, the perfect function that we uh, expect. So these points are uh, were basically uh, generated by some sort of uh, parabola, but of course they are not perfect. You can never get a perfect result in the real world. So you will always get some sort of noise and uh, so on. Uh, so they are not perfect. They are a bit offset from that uh, parabola, but they were generated by it. And of course in, uh, perfect case, we would like to somehow restore that parabola if that is possible. Uh, so, but uh, now I want to show you which problems we can get when we are <clears throat> creating our models. So if our model is too stiff and you give it too little parameters, so for example, I want to go with linear functions. Uh, you see that you can't fit these points with a linear function. This is called high bias model. It means that you take, you took some uh, small set of your models, uh, but it's far away from the function you are trying to fit. So uh, it underfits the data. So this is underfit. Uh, in case if I take too large number of parameters, uh, that's on the right panel, you can see it here. So your model is too flexible. 
uh, please check it out. What it did, it perfectly passed through each blue point. So if you check, I don't know, some, if you check somehow the, uh, how it performs on your train set, you will see that this is a perfect model. It perfectly gets through every point, but it's nothing uh, even close to the parabola we had at the beginning. And if you test it on a validation set, you will see that it's a disaster. So if you take, for example, this point, uh, you will see, uh, oh. if you will take this point and you will check uh, what our model predicts, you can't even see it on this plot. It's somewhere down there below. So this is a very bad model. And this is the case of high variance model or, or overfit. So the model is too flexible. So we don't want our model to be too flexible uh, or too stiff. So we want to find something in between. <clears throat> and that's really up to us to find that exact good model that gives you the best fit. And of course, the best fit you define uh, with the validation score. So here is uh, the plot that shows you model score uh, versus model complexity. So when I'm just starting with very simple models, I have high bias. It performs purely on the training set and purely on the validation set. Uh, so here, uh, here it is. So linear model that tries to model some sort of parabola. Of course, it's too stiff. It's, um, you need more complex model. When you are uh, some sort of increasing its complexity, from the engineering point of view, it means that you are endowing it with more and more parameters. So you are giving it more and more free parameters that can be trained. Uh, you are getting your best model. So this best model, it's uh, when you get the best validation score. Uh, when you are giving it uh, even more parameters, the model becomes too flexible. As you see, it still gets better and better on training set. So it can get almost perfect. So this is uh, the case, the right case. It's almost perfect on the training set, but it gets worse and worse on the validation set. And this is one more reason why you don't want to ever try to test your models on your training set, because you will you will always overlook uh, your <clears throat> uh, the overfit. So try not to overlook overfit. Uh, thus use validation, separate validation set. Uh, here's a different example. Uh, once again, I'm trying some sort of uh, regression. And uh, as you see, I'm adding uh, <clears throat> to the degree of the function I'm using to fit all these points. And uh, here I use uh, validation curve. It's uh, shown in red and uh, training curve shown in uh, blue. And as you see, if I'm increasing uh, the degree, uh, training set score is getting always better and better and better. Uh, but validation score, it was good uh, when the degree was three, but then it gets a little bit uh, worse and worse, and then it just drops almost to zero. So uh, you basically don't want your model to be too complicated. Uh, one more thing you can do, uh, that's quite an interesting uh, point. Uh, if you have uh, your model overcomplicated, you can increase the size of your data set. Of course, if you have the ability to collect more data, because uh, some data is collected in quite a complex way, and it's not always you can get enough data or you can uh, somehow add more to your data set. So that depends on the problem you are solving. But if you are able to collect more data, uh, that may help you with a model that is too complicated. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here is one more uh, pure schematic. Uh, please see, when I am increasing the training set size, uh, our validation score starts to grow. So I was starting with some overcomplicated model. It had too many parameters. It had a really well training score, as you see. Let's say it was almost to one, yeah? Uh, and it had a low validation score uh, because this model was definitely overfitting. And when you are getting more and more data, you are forcing this model to get out of that overfit. Uh, so its training score uh, falls. So you might think, well, what happens? It uh, performs uh, not so good but its validation score grows. And uh, what really matters is the validation score. 
uh, because uh, these are the results that you get on data points uh, the model hadn't seen during training. So this is the only way to test whether it generalizes good or not. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so F4, uh, the first part. Uh, what do we do when our model performs purely? First of all, uh, you consider what is it? High bias or high variance? High bias or underfit or high variance or overfit? So uh, that the first, you should do a classification and understand what happens. How do you classify that? You check how your model performs on training set and on validation set. If you get bad result on both train, training and validation sets, you consider this is high bias. So your model is too stiff and you are, <clears throat> and you should do something with high bias. What can you do? Maybe you need more features. More features, um, they <clears throat> imply that your model becomes more complicated and uh, that may make your result better. Uh, maybe you can just use more sophisticated models. So add more parameters. Uh, maybe uh, you can uh, decrease regularization. So uh, there's some sort uh, of methods of constraining parameters uh, within the model. I, I hope that I will be able uh, to get in time and show it to you uh, in the next part. <clears throat> if you are uh, getting uh, very good results on a training set, but bad results on a validation set, it's probably high variance. So this is overfit. What do you do? Uh, you should somehow simplify the model. So you, maybe you should take a simpler model or you can use fewer features. So maybe uh, you are using too much features. So fewer features, they basically imply that your model will become a little bit simpler uh, or you use more training samples. So maybe your data set is too small. So pro it, it may happen that the problem you are solving uh, really needs some complicated model. Uh, but it doesn't work just uh, because you have uh, two small data sets, so you need more sample. That's okay. Or you can increase regularization. Uh, so uh, you basically having the same number of parameters within the model, but you are constraining that parameter. So you are saying, I don't want this, uh, for example, I know parameter A to be from minus to plus infinity. I want to constrain it from zero to one. And that basically constrains model in some way, and it probably may help you with uh, high variance or overfit. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I think that's enough for the introduction uh, to uh, <clears throat> to machine learning. And now I want to uh, proceed uh, with uh, one of the methods of machine learning uh, within the time uh, I I have. Uh, so hopefully <clears throat> we'll get in time. Uh, okay. Uh, so what I told you at the uh, beginning, uh, we will be talking mostly about um, supervised learning. And supervised learning, it's a big branch. It has two sub branches. Uh, one is classification and one is regression. So what I, uh, what do I want to show you right now is uh, uh, regression. So uh, the simplest case, so probably a simple uh, linear regression, uh, you should be familiar with that, uh, but I want to just uh, recap a few points and maybe show, uh, show you something new that you haven't, hopefully. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, it's a really old method. So as you see, uh, this uh, Twitter says that uh, Legendre uh, published uh, the method of least square in 1805. Uh, so <clears throat> 1805, it was quite a long time ago. Uh, and you probably know it uh, from uh, your calculus uh, class. So the problem is as follows. So you have a bunch of points uh, that are characterized with uh, X and Y coordinate. And uh, you want to somehow draw a line uh, that fits these points as good as possible. Uh, uh, what does it have to do with uh, the previous things I told you? So why is it a uh, method of uh, machine learning? Uh, so uh, please see, what do we have? Uh, we have all functions. Within these functions, we choose a model. We take all linear functions and we say, these are our models. So that's uh, quite the mathematician's point of view of machine learning. What would we do? We have a data, we have all this point, that's our data set. We have a data and with this data, 
we will choose among this model, among these linear functions, we will choose the one uh, that uh, suits us the best. Of course, we should somehow come up with the idea how do we do that? That's okay. Uh, but that's perfectly the mathematician's point of view of uh, the machine learning method. Uh, when you get to code, you will basically do the same as I told you in the engineering's point of view to uh, the machine learning. You will write a program, program that basically calculates uh, some sort of A plus uh, BX. You have three parameters, A and B. So your program wouldn't work uh, until you uh, plug in some numbers for this A and B. Where do you get this A and B? You will write a separate training or learning or feeding algorithm. How do you call it? Uh, and this algorithm will take in the data, the points X, Y you have, and will calculate this A and B for you so that you can plug in this A and B and you will get the model a plus bx with defined a and b that will work for you and predict some further values for given x. So this is a perfectly machine learning method. Yes, it's very simple. It's studied in calculus one probably, but anyway, that's a machine learning method. So that uh, so probably you were familiar with machine learning before you knew that it's called machine learning. <clears throat> okay, how do we do that? Uh, First of all, we should define which functions from the like uh, from linear functions are good and uh, which linear functions are bad. Uh, most cases, you will do that with so-called sum of squared errors (S S E), uh, and here is the formula. What it basically means: <clears throat> uh, these are our points. So uh, in red, you see uh, points. Uh, blue line, uh, it's uh, our model. So uh, we have uh, a model and uh, we are trying to, uh, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, somehow I lose my, my pen, that is, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so what, uh, what do we basically do? Uh, uh, you should, uh, first of all, I want you uh, to mention that this X and Y they are very different. X is a feature. So uh, that's a, a feature uh, that is measured and that you are passing as an input. This Y is a class. So that's a class that you are producing. Uh, yes, uh, this is a real number. Uh, so it's regression uh, problem. It's not classification problem. Uh, but uh, this is basically the output. So. Uh, <clears throat> X and Y are very, very different. Uh, I want you to, um, to note that. Uh, that's why when we are measuring the discrepancy between our prediction and uh, the data we have, uh, we are measuring basically along Y. Why along Y? <laughs> because uh, Y is basically our prediction, it's the output. And the Y of this point is the expected output. So we are basically uh, measuring the difference between the expected output and the output we got. That's good. Uh, what do we want to do with that? So uh, we have many points. We have many of these differences. Um, of course, just adding them together will not uh, do the job because some are uh, positive, some are negative, and so on. You can add their absolute values. You will get so-called uh, let, least absolute uh, deviation, or it's called something like that. Uh, or you can add their squares, and you will get the SSE I have shown you. Uh, here is a nice geometric interpretation. So uh, you are basically building uh, some sort of squares that are touch touching the line, and one of their corners is uh, the point of our data point. And you are adding uh, <coughs> their areas. And when you add their areas, uh, you get uh, basically the SS. Um, okay, uh, the next point I want to make uh, that all problems in machine learning is some sort of uh, maximization or minimization of something. So you should, uh, so whatever you do, uh, at the end of the day, you get uh, <clears throat> some function that uh, you should minimize or uh, maximize. And when you are doing, uh, <clears throat> uh, so what are we uh, minimizing or maximizing uh, in uh, this case? 
let's see. <clears throat> uh, sum of squared errors basically gives us uh, some function. Uh, this function can be minimized or maximized uh, with respect uh, to the uh, parameters uh, we have. And here is an uh, example of uh, that. Uh, so let's check it out. Uh, here are sample, uh, our data points. They are in red. Uh, blue line shows uh, the perfect regression line. So it's basically what we uh, want to get. How do we get there? Uh, the uh, green line uh, shows us uh, our uh, test function. So we are at, uh, at this point, we are testing some, uh, some sort of uh, linear function. And we are trying to understand how good is it. Uh, so at the moment, I'm trying to change this function. So I'm changing parameters k and uh, parameter b. Depending on this k and b, I can plug them in into that formula for SSE. I can plug them in. And I can get the value of the SSE. As you might see, everything is defined here except parameters a and b in this case. <clears throat> Uh, so let's check the right plot. As you see on the right plot, uh, this is our SSP. Uh, X and Y coordinates, uh, they basically represent A and B parameters. Uh, <clears throat> so when I am uh, changing position of this green line, uh, you might see that the green dot is moving. This dot is basically showing the value of the SSE. And what we want to do, we want to get it to the minimum. So we want to minimize the uh, sum of squared errors. So this is what we are basically doing. So we are minimizing it by choosing different functions. And as you see, I am changing this green line. You might see that the dot is moving. And if I am good and precise enough, I can get it to almost minimum. <clears throat> this is a really nice function. Um, I'll try to use uh, 3D to show you how it looks like. There's basically a parabola. Um, well, not very well seen in this plot, but uh, you might imagine that uh, this is sort of parabola in 3D. Uh, okay, and one more uh, point to make here, uh, number of uh, coordinates. So uh, I, uh, I'm working here in 3D, uh, I'm plotting it in 3D, uh, why? Uh, because I have two parameters, linear function A plus BX, I have two parameters A and B, uh, and of course the value of the function on the B axis. <clears throat> Uh, why uh, am I uh, saying all that? Uh, because when I increase the number of points, uh, you should notice uh, that this plot still uh, stays 2D. So you have still two parameters, A and B. It does not depend on the number of uh, data points you have. Uh, or if I plot it in 3D, you will have three dimensions and still two parameters, A and B, and value of uh, the function. Okay, so uh, the takeout here, uh, all uh, machine learning uh, problems are some sort of minimization or maximization of something. Uh, what something that depends on the method you are using. So in case of linear regression, that's SSD. In other cases, you will get something different. If you build a neural network, you are building some sort of gigantic function and uh, you will be minimizing that function. So hopefully uh, we will get to that tomorrow and I will show you how do you minimize that, but uh, this is the way. Uh, okay, uh, minimization problems are well known for a very long time. I'm just, uh, uh, I will probably uh, skip almost everything here, uh, but what I wanna, uh, want you to see, uh, first of all, standard form of uh, optimization problems uh, we are often using, it's minimize some function with respect to X, but it can be subject to some more constraints. So uh, you might want some different functions to be less than zero or equal to zero or whatever. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's a sort of problem you wanna uh, always uh, reduce your problem too. So if you have, uh, if you are coming up with some new ML method, 
And at some point, you will reduce it uh, to this form. You will say, I will get the best function. I will get my fit, uh, my fitted function or my trained function. Uh, when I perform minimization of something of this form, uh, you should know that we have a lot of methods that can do minimization of this form. So it's, uh, so it's, almost, it's solved. At, th at this point, your problem is solved because you have standard method, you have a lot of libraries that can perform that numerically and so on and so on. <clears throat> uh, so uh, this is uh, your goal when you are developing some new methods. Uh, okay, in most uh, problems I will show you, we will minimize so-called convex function. That's really nice function because I have one minimum or one maximum depending on the function. So let's say one minimum, yeah. It's a local minimum, it's a global minimum and so on. Uh, minimization problems are very complicated uh, because uh, you basically you never uh, uh, know how your function looks like. <clears throat> you can cal calculate only a finite number of points. Uh, so it's really hard to guess what are you dealing with. Uh, these are examples of few functions that uh, <clears throat> have different sort of uh, pathologies. Uh, this is the uh, Rastrigin function. Uh, and you see it's oscillates, uh, it's oscillates, and it's really hard to get out from some local minimum uh, to get to the global minimum. Uh, you can have a settle point. Uh, it's obviously not minimum, but some methods are converging to the settle point uh, in place of uh, finding a real minimum. So it can happen. New Newton's method, method is uh, converging to settle point. <clears throat> Uh, you can have a really shallow function that has almost uh, no gradients, uh, and it's really hard to find uh, some minimum uh, right there. Or you can have a long valley function, very well known uh, Rosenbrock function, uh, and it's really hard to get uh, through this valley. Uh, here is uh, the image, so you should get uh, through all these points and somehow find <clears throat> uh, the real minimum that is at uh, 1, 1. Uh, but we have many, many methods uh, that can solve something like that. And uh, these methods are basically uh, classified with so-called order. Uh, so uh, order is uh, how many derivatives you need to calculate uh, for your method to work. So uh, you might need no, uh, no derivatives. Here is the uh, noder need method. It doesn't need any derivatives at all. I was very surprised when I learned about this method on my own. And here is an example how it basically works. So uh, you can hear about uh, maybe it's called um, I don't know I for, I forgot it has some <clears throat> some one more name so it may be more uh, familiar to you with that name but it's uh, so called Nordle, Nolder meat method. <clears throat> it doesn't need any derivatives at all. Uh, more well known, uh, if you have ever uh, seen uh, neural networks or some problems with neural networks, uh, so-called methods of uh, first order methods, uh, they need a gradient. So when you calculate uh, a gradient, uh, you can basically do uh, so-called uh, standard, uh, standard gradient descent. So it's uh, when you are moving uh, against the gradient, uh, searching for uh, the minimum. Uh, there are many mod modifications of this method uh, because it's it's not perfect. It has its uh, problems, and um, I just have no time to <clears throat> to go through all of that. Uh, but it's uh, it's very simple, but it has uh, many problems. Uh, so you should do something with that. And uh, there are many modifications of uh, this method. Some are modifying uh, that uh, gradient uh, <clears throat> part, uh, like uh, gradient with momentum. Uh, some are modifying its uh, learning rate. So you probably heard the uh, term learning rate that basically uh, means this uh, parameter uh, that tells you how long steps do you want to make uh, when you are uh, minimizing. And here is a bunch of methods and years uh, they were developed, as you see, even uh, 2018 uh, AMS grad was uh, developed. And this, all these different methods are modifications of uh, so-called gradient descent. Uh, here is a small example of how these methods work on some uh, really bad function. Uh, so here is a function I want to show you. It has uh, many local minima. Uh, and here are traces of uh, these different methods. So let me start. <clears throat> uh, 
if it starts why doesn't it start mm. Ah, it started. Okay, so here are traces uh, of uh, different methods. Uh, <clears throat> uh, once again, I'm not getting into details, uh, but as you see, different methods be uh, behave differently. Uh, some of them may find the exact uh, minimum, some of them may not. Uh, this is basically the problem that you tackle when you are creating neural networks. So, so in some cases you get good result, in some cases you get bad result, and that may heavily uh, depend on the method you are using for minimization. Uh, okay, <clears throat> there are uh, so-called second order methods uh, like Newton method and so on, uh, but I'm not covering them here because uh, they are basically they are rarely used, uh, especially for uh, neural networks. Uh, why? Because when you are calculating uh, some first order method, uh, you need to uh, <clears throat> keep track of all your uh, values of your function and all the uh, gradients, so all the part your gradients. Uh, it's uh, already a lot of data because in a neural network, you may already have, I don't know, a million or maybe a billion of parameters and you will need to keep track of gradient with respect to each of these parameters. Uh, when you are getting to second order methods, you should keep track of all the second order derivatives and there is a n squared of them. So if you have uh, 10 to the six of parameters in your neural network, you will have 10 to the 12th per, uh, number of uh, second derivatives you, uh, you should keep track of. That's uh, way too much. So you probably will never see uh, any second order method when you are uh, training, your, uh, training some neural network. Well, except it's something really, really simple and someone wants to, I don't know, experiment with, with that uh, because you will definitely run into too large number of uh, parameters. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Uh, you can uh, do um, this uh, linear regression, uh, let's say semi-analytically. So you can write uh, some sort of formulas and uh, try to calculate it uh, with respect to that formulas. Uh, here is it, uh, the example of formulas you might uh, have gotten in uh, your calculus class. Uh, <clears throat> it really looks really messy. Uh, if you studied uh, linear regression in context uh, of, uh, let's say, statistic, uh, uh, you may uh, have seen this kind of formula. Uh, it looks uh, much better. And basically, uh, <clears throat> this parameter, uh, this parameter rho, uh, that is the uh, correlation uh, quotient, that is what basically gives its name to regression. Uh, so linear regression, the term regression, uh, comes from uh, regression towards mean. Uh, it's too bad, no time to, to cover what is it, but you can uh, check it on Wikipedia, what is regression towards mean, and the word regression comes from that. Uh, the word linear comes not from the fact it's drawing, uh, uh, drawing lines. It's not always drawing lines. Uh, I hope I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, but because it is a linear combination of some sort of basis functions. So it may be not linear, it may be something else, uh, <clears throat> but it's still a linear combination of something else. Uh, okay, and uh, here you see the plot that shows you that this row makes our regression line a bit lower than uh, standard deviation line. Uh, and from this formula, you see that it always passes through the center of mass. So no time to prove, um, just as takeout. It always passes through the center of mass. That's one thing. The second thing, it always is, uh, gets a little bit lower than standard deviation line. Uh, so you may see here that uh, this would be a standard devi uh, deviation line. And we have uh, some sort of offset from it. That depends on the correlation uh, quotient. And uh, the stronger the correlation, the uh, less is the deviation. So here is a stronger correlation. We have less deviation. Uh, less correlation, more deviation. OK. Uh, its quality is measured by so-called parameter R squared. <clears throat> uh, it's uh, basically the fraction of initial data variance, uh, how much of the initial data variance is explained by the fitted model. 
uh, we consider that uh, variance in the data is uh, carrying up uh, some useful information, basically. So uh, here is why we care so much about variation. Uh, you might think of it uh, from this point of view. Uh, so let's say you have some features that is always constant, and you are trying to perform some sort of uh, classification problem. Uh, would this feature be helpful to you? Well, definitely it will not. How can you... Uh, split two classes if uh, this feature is always a constant. It's equal for both of them. Uh, so you can't get any insights. So is this data point, uh, does, does this data point belong to class A or to class B? There's no way to do that with a constant feature. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that's why you always care about variation. So if you say that feature is uh, somehow different in your data set, so you are probably expecting that it's carrying some useful data, uh, some useful information, and uh, you can use this information to perform your task. Uh, of course, it may happen that it carries just noise. Yeah, the world is not perfect. But anyway, uh, in most cases, you will consider variation as some good thing. And that's why uh, if uh, we are building some model, our model is giving us some sort of variation and uh, we are considering this variation as the amount of information we are getting from our model. And when we are calculating the fraction of this variation with respect to the initial variation, we are basically getting the result that means how many uh, of that initial amount of information can be explained with our model. And of course, we aim for some bigger numbers. Uh, word of caution, if you are trying to uh, compare uh, uh, linear regression in uh, spaces of, uh, with different number of features, so uh, different number of independent uh, variables, uh, you might get into troubles because it always gets better and uh, better if you compute it like that. And to compare uh, linear regression with different number of independence uh, variables, you should use adjusted uh, coefficient of uh, determination. Here is the formula, not getting into details. Uh, just know that uh, there is a problem and you should use something a little bit better. Uh, here was an example of calculating all, all of that. It's just plugging the numbers into the formulas I showed you. Uh, so skipping it, skipping it. Um, you're making linear regression with uh, NumPy and Python. So basically we have libraries that can do everything for us and we just get numbers of that. Uh, that's pretty simple. <clears throat> uh, the same thing, just growing plots to show that uh, our regression works fine. and. Uh, so on. <clears throat> uh, here is a <clears throat> interactive example of uh, uh, how the SK learns uh, linear regression works. Uh, it's freezing a bit, uh, so I don't know if I will be able uh, to start it or not. <clears throat> anyway, I'll try. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, just a reminder, meanwhile, that uh, seven minutes left. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, then I'll skip that. Uh, I'll proceed with something more, more interesting. Uh, okay, so what I told you about linear regression, it works uh, with... Uh, uh, some basis functions and calculates you some sort of uh, beta sum of that function. Uh, so here is an interesting uh, <clears throat> case for uh, for you. Uh, okay, I'm skipping all this part. Uh, or say a few words. I know, I'll, I'll say you a few words. I just saw a few articles on uh, ArcSide that uh, use uh, this sort of formulas for uh, quantum machine learning. So I think I, sh I should show that to you. It's called a matrix method. So it's a point of view on linear regression. When you are trying to do a linear regression uh, with uh, some sort of uh, matrix uh, magic, uh, what, what we are doing here? So we are basically uh, taking all our data points and we are stacking them together into uh, the matrix. Uh, so here is the matrix we get. Uh, and in this matrix, uh, we get uh, columns uh, that correspond to features. Uh, 
uh, and we have rows that corresponds to our data points. Uh, that's what we basically get. Uh, what can we do with that matrix? Uh, we can pose our problem right now as the problem of finding something like that. So we have this matrix X. We are multiplying it by some vector W that contains all the parameters of our linear model. Uh, so we are multiplying row by column. So when you are multiplying row by column, you are always multiplying uh, feature one with its parameter, say W1. You are multiplying feature N with it with its parameter uh, WN. Uh, and at, uh, at the end of the day, you get a new vector, a bunch of numbers. That is your prediction. And you want this prediction to be uh, approximately equal to what you have measured to your Y. Of course, you should define this approximately somehow. And uh, there is a way to define it. You, uh, you calculate the difference between the two vectors and you take their norm squared. You once again, get the SSE. Uh, skipping all the mass, uh, you can uh, get uh, this sort of uh, result. So you can get that uh, your parameters vector W is equal to this sort of uh, construction, X transposed, X, X transposed X to the minus one on X transposed on Y. Uh, this is called the, the pseudo-inverse matrix, uh, matrix of X. Uh, here is how it's defined. Uh, pseudo-inverse of more pen rows, I guess. <clears throat> and you can use it uh, for uh, calculation. In practice, it's actually used um, in this uh, row weight quite rarely because uh, you may have some instabilities. Uh, this inverse, uh, it, uh, you can calculate it all, always, but... Uh, the determinant may be very small, so you may have some troubles with that. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, what it gives us uh, is one more interesting point of view, is the point of view of uh, linear algebra. Uh, when I was constructing this matrix, uh, uh, this one, <clears throat> uh, uh, what happens when I multiply it by some vector W? Uh, I can look at it as multiplying uh, each column of uh, this vector uh, of uh, this matrix by uh, parameter w, uh, w. As you see, it's vector x1 multiplied by w1, x2 by w2, and uh, making a sum. What it means, uh, let's, uh, let's think if I take all possible w uh, vectors, what could I have? I will have some sort of linear subspace that is basically spanned by the columns of the matrix. It's called a column space. So whatever I can get by multiplying matrix X of all my data points by some sort of parameters vectors uh, W, parameter, <clears throat> parameters vector W, I will get the result that lies in the column space. The vector I have measured, Y, can lie somewhere outside that space. So here is the column space CX. Here is the vector Y. It may lie somewhere outside. What do I want to do? I want to find in this column space, I can't get out of that column space. Why? Because I am getting uh, my parameters W and I will multiply X by that W. I will always get something in that column space. I can't get out of that column space, but I want to find here a vector that is the closest possible one to the vector of measured values, y. And the closest vectors, it appears in the projection of y to the column space. <clears throat> so here is the neat thing. So you are basically taking vector y, you are projecting it to some subspace, some linear subspace, and you are getting of that uh, <clears throat> the closest vector to the y. So basically the predictions of your model that you can get if you uh, find the right w. Uh, here are the calculations, keeping everything once again. Uh, but here is uh, one more neat thing. Uh, when we were calculating our R squared, so uh, that percent of explained variation, uh, you may see if you get into all this uh, stuff, uh, you can uh, find that this uh, R squared is basically equal to the cosine of this interesting uh, angle theta. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our fitted y. This is our observed y. Uh, this is uh, the vector of residuals. So it's uh, observed minus our model. Here is the vector uh, y that contains uh, basically mean values for each feature. 
uh, it lives in a column space. You can prove that uh, it lives in a column space and it contains a mean values for each feature. Uh, you might remember that I told you that the regression line always passes through the center of mass. So here is basically center of mass. <clears throat> and if you uh, draw these two vectors uh, to the observed y and to the fitted y, the angle between them, theta, uh, cosine of it, would be r squared. So it's a really nice geometric interpretation of this r squared. So it's uh, it's variation uh, regression to variation of data or it's the sign of the theta. Uh, regression in any basis is performed uh, almost the same way, but what you are doing, uh, instead of passing some raw features into your linear regression, uh, you perform some calculation on them. So you are calculating some basis function. So here is a new matrix phi that you get. Instead of raw features x, uh, x1, x2, and so on, you are getting some basis function phi1, phi2, phi n that are calculated on the whole data point x1. And you do everything the same with it to get the result of this linear regression. Uh, what does it give to us? First of all, uh, you can, <clears throat> for example, I use one feature x and I use basis of uh, one x, x squared and x to the third. Uh, and I do a uh, regression with this basis. What do I get as a result? I get a polynomial that will more or less fit my data points. Uh, too bad I have no time to show you the example of that, but sklearn is perfectly capable of doing that. And you might even see traces of this philosophical idea in how it's implemented. You make a pipeline. You make from your data polynomial features. So you are transforming your data points in something else, and you are passing that something else into linear regression. And the result you get is quotients that you will use with your basis functions to get the uh, resulting function that will fit your points. <clears throat> so that's what you get. Uh, Unfortunately, okay. we are already out of time. Out of time, okay. So uh, maybe you can good. continue with this tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's a really good point to stop because we got to the uh, regularization. I think I will continue with that tomorrow and we will get to a different one more method as we am. So thank everyone for being here with me. <clears throat> if you, if anyone has any questions, you can write them in chat and uh, Vitaly can answer them tomorrow, for example uh or we will just write them to you in some sort of form uh so yeah feel free to ask if you had any questions and i'll share the link to this lecture later as well uh so now it's a coffee break in seven minutes uh, we continue with the next lecture andrei semenov for now we have a break thank you vitali okay thank you So, good morning, Volodymyr. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, okay. So, I just okay. check. I will share my maybe screen and